so far what we've discussed when we've been talking about solutes moving across a selectively permeable membrane have involved either simple diffusion or facilitated diffusion, right? So simple diffusion is just allowing materials to move down their concentration gradient across this membrane. Now, sometimes those materials, those solutes can't move by themselves across the membrane, even though they want to right either they're polar or they're charged and so in this case we use facilitated diffusion in conjunction with those transport proteins to help give that safe passageway to those solutes so that they can move down their concentration gradient across that plasma membrane now both simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion across that membrane are still examples of passive transport, right? For two reasons. Number one, the solutes are moving down their concentration gradient. And number two, the cell doesn't have to exert any of its own energy to get those solutes to move. Now, sometimes the cell might want things to go in the opposite direction. And it might want to perform what is called active transport. For active transport, we do the opposite of passive. So first of all, we're going to be moving solutes against their concentration gradient. And number two, this is going to require energy. Hence why we call it active transport. So active transport moves substances against their concentration gradients. This allows the cell actually to maintain differences in concentration across the membrane, right? So some solutes might be more concentrated on the inside of the cell than the outside or vice versa. Active transport also requires energy. And remember, usually the way that cells pay for things that take place on the inside of the cell is through the use of an ATP molecule. And active transport is no different. The cell is going to have to use some of its ATP to get those solutes more concentrated on one side of the membrane. Also, the cell is going to need some help. So the solutes aren't going to move on their own. They're going to have to be moved by very specific transport proteins that are embedded within that plasma membrane. So let's take a look at an example of one of these very important active transport proteins. This particular protein is called the sodium potassium pump. Now this guy is unique in that yes, it does function in active transport. So it has the ability to interact with ATP to get the whole process going. Also, it's actually specific for two different solutes versus just one like other transport proteins. This particular uh, transport protein is specific for both sodium ions and potassium ions, hence we, why we call it the sodium potassium pump. And so if we take a look at our first picture here, in this image, we have our sodium potassium pump here in purple embedded in the plasma membrane. And we also have a very specific concentration of sodium and potassium ions either on the inside or the outside of the cell. So if we take a look at the outside of the cell, here we have sodium ions that are high and potassium ions that are low. On the inside of the cell, we have sodium ions that are low and potassium ions that are high. And so the cell wants to maintain that difference in concentration. So it's going to continue to pump sodium ions out where their concentration is already high. And it's going to pump potassium ions into the cell where their concentration is already high. So let's take a look at how this process happens. So typically the sodium potassium pump will be open or facing the cytoplasmic side of the cell. It'll accept three sodium ions to fit into binding sites on the inside of the protein. Next, an ATP molecule comes along and it breaks in the presence of water, it hydrolyzes, and it donates one of its phosphate groups to the sodium potassium pump. Through the addition of the extra phosphate, the shape of the sodium potassium pump changes and it flips open to the opposite side of the membrane. When it does so, it releases the sodium ions into the extracellular space where their concentration is already high. This also then frees up space for two potassium ions to come in and bind to the inside of the sodium potassium pump. At this point, the phosphate group is removed off of the sodium potassium pump and it will return back to its original shape facing the inside of the cell. And this releases those two potassium ions into the inside of the cell, again to an area where their concentration is already high. And the cycle can continue to repeat over and over again, so long as there's enough ATP and ions present. 
So let's take a look at a video that will summarize this process of active transport using the sodium potassium pump as a great example. Sometimes a cell needs to move a solute against its concentration gradient. This process is called active transport, and it requires input of energy from ATP. For instance, most animal cells need to expel sodium ions, Na+, and take in potassium ions, K+, both against their concentration gradients. Here is how the sodium-potassium pump works. Sodium ions bind to a transport protein. ATP transfers a phosphate group to the protein, providing the energy that causes the protein to change shape and push the sodium ions across the membrane, where they are released outside the cell. Potassium ions now bind to the transport protein, and the phosphate group is released. This causes the protein to return to its original shape, releasing the potassium ions inside the cell. The transport protein is now ready to repeat the process.